Hello and welcome to this lecture on narrative patterns in, in the flood. There are uh, two very interesting narrative pattern types and uh, they are linear narration and circular narration. I'll deal with linear narration first. Now what exactly is linear narration? In a linear narration the central character is displaced from the home environment either voluntarily or involuntarily. So, uh, the central character is taken away from the home space. Either he is forced to do that or he does it voluntarily for certain reasons. Now, there is a particular causation or a particular set of causal factors for this displacement. The displacement could be because of poverty or it could be because of parental rejection. The causation could also be because of natural or external factors over which the central character has no control. Some natural factors could include flooding, earthquakes and things like that. Now if we look at the short story in question for this week, in the flood what exactly is the causation? The causation is natural calamity. So, Chenin is displaced from his hut or his home space by flooding, mo uh, monsoons and uh, hard rain, heavy rain. Now, the same thing applies to his dog as well. The dog is displaced from his home space from uh, the hut because of natural calamity that is the flood caused by heavy monsoon rains. Now, this displacement is a very interesting uh, thematic category. Uh, some critics interpret this displacement as a sort of a journey towards achieving maturity. It is a process of growing up for the central character. It could also be, uh, you know, uh, it could also be towards achieving success or survival for the central character. So, how should we look at displacement? Displacement could have certain set of thematic uh, implications. In terms of narrative, the displacement is a plot catalyst. It starts the plot re uh, rolling. It kind of pushes the narrative into functioning. Now, in a linear narration, once the hero is displaced, the hero starts to overcome his inner doubts certain natural objects and human and supernatural adversaries to reach a new happier and more fulfilling home. So, uh, from the home space the hero is displaced and he starts to move towards a new happier and more satisfying home environment. Now, let us apply this to the case of Chenin in, in the flood. What happens there? Chenin obviously overcomes inner doubts. Let us have an example of this um, as an analysis. In the chapter, uh, in, the, in the story, let us see what happens when Chenin is, Chenin's heart is flooded. Chenin was now deep, knee deep in water as he stood on his platform. A couple of rows of thatch on the roof slipped under water. Chenin shouted for help, but who was there to hear? This last phrase, who was there to hear is very interesting in relation to this concept about linear narration and the role of the central character or hero. As um, the concept says, the hero will overcome inner doubts. He has his own doubts as to whether he will be rescued, whether Chenin will be rescued and he asks that question, uh, who is there to hear? But then rescue does happen for Chenin. Rescue does happen as a neighbor comes with a boat and rescues him. But if we apply the same uh, concept to his dog's case, what happens? That is a different question. Is the dog rescued? Um, those who are first who have read the story will know that does not happen. Now, let us look at the object of a linear narration. What is the object of a linear narration? The object is to survive. The destination of a linear narration is to survive or to succeed and each journey in a linear narration is structured around a journey, a movement from one setting to another. In the case of Chenin and in the flood, Chenin moves from his flooded hut to Ambalapura. 
there is a movement there as you can see and then eventually he returns from Amblapura to his own hut at the end of the story. So there is a journey that Chenin undertakes in order to achieve survival in his case. So as I said in the flood um, there is a movement from flooded home to dry land. In other words it's a movement from a critical or a crisis um, situation to a situation where Chenin survives. Linear narratives generally move from the home space to the other space, the space that is away from home and then they return back um, to the home space once the hero has attained the necessary level of maturity, once the hero has survived or once the hero has succeeded. Now, Let's look at non-linear narratives. Some examples of non-linear narratives are flashbacks or stream of consciousness. Flashbacks tell the story of one's youth. The story could be about personal growth or it could be about innocent, innocence lost. So the narrator kind of revisits one's uh, past and then uh, comes up with the story about it. In the case of stream of consciousness, the author pays no heed to time and traditional conventions of narration are broken there. Everything is narrated from the consciousness of the narrator, that's stream of consciousness. Now, let's see what exactly is circular narratives. The same concept of displacement happens in circular narratives too. The central character is displaced from the home environment either voluntarily or involuntarily. So the hero is removed from his home ground and the causation again could be similar. It could be because of poverty or it could be because of rejection by the parents and other factors could include natural calamities or external uh, factors such as political turmoil. So these are the causal factors that remove the hero or the heroine or the central character from the home space. And again in the circular journey although similar obstacles are overcome the point of departure is also the destination. So the desire to return to the home space is the driving force for the narrative here in circular narratives. If we go back to linear narratives um, sometimes the central character returns home but sometimes they don't that's also very possible. The ultimate home that they reach there the central characters are better or sometimes more fulfilling or satisfying but in the case of circular narratives the desire is to come home. And when they return home, the central characters assume more self-fulfilling roles within the family structure. There is a growth for the better, um, there is at least a desire to be better on the part of the central characters once they have come back home. Now we, if we apply circular narratives um, concept to in the flood what happens? Let's see, Chenin is displaced, he overcomes obstacles that is the flooded uh, um, home and then he moves away from the home to Amrapla and uh, once the rains have receded he comes home. So we can see a circular narrative there uh, in the case of Chenin very clearly mapped out. Now the big question is, is he going to perform better as a human being on his return? We do not know for sure, he may or he may not. The short story just offers a glimpse into uh, a particular slice of Chenin's life uh, at one point in time. So uh, we do not know what exactly Chenin thinks when he finds his um, dead dog at the end of the story. The story stops there. So uh, his growth, his personal growth as a better, more holistic, a humane human being um, is something that we can speculate on. Let's apply the same concept of the circular narrative to the case of Chenin's dog. So again the dog is displaced from the hut, the dog we have to note doesn't overcome obstacles. There is nobody to rescue the dog from that situation of crisis. The dog continues to remain in a flooded home and um, the dog dies because uh, it tries to eat a carcass, it falls into the water and is drowned and attacked by the uh, crocodiles as well. So uh, 
the circular narrative is cut off and there happens to be a sort of a linear narrative with a tragic end there. There is no better home for the dog on this space on earth. Perhaps he gets a better uh, home space in, in heaven, but we do not know that for sure. So, um, the circular narrative fails to take off in the case of Chenin's dog and the linear narrative of Shannon's dog ends in tragedy. So, it is very uh, interesting and very profitable to think about the stories in terms of linear narration and circular narration and see if these concepts can be applied to this very interesting story and what are the implications, uh, what are the thematic significances that we can derive once we apply these narrative patterns to the story. Um, this is a very interesting exercise to uh, practice. Now, let us look at another category of narrative pattern. Uh, this is called frame structures. The other term that we use for uh, to talk about uh, this type of narrative pattern is uh, embedded narrative. And embedded narratives consists of uh, smaller stories within the context or frame of a larger story. So, there is a larger story and within the larger story there is a smaller story. So, um, that in effect is a frame structure. The framing narrative is usually shorter, um, it is it's, it's brief whereas, the embedded story, the story within the story, uh, the inner story is longer in duration in, in narrative uh, so to speak. The embedded narrative hinges contextually uh, on the outer narrative. Um, that is something we need to keep in mind. Um, the outer story gives life to the inner story, though the inner story has the capacity to stand on its, to on its own. It can be an individual story in itself, um, that is possible. However, an interpretation of the embedded narrative in relation to the uh, frame story is more meaningful in the context of the larger story. Um, there are several layers of meaning um, that can be uh, unraveled and, and, and such a uh, revelation has implications for the larger story as well. We can apply this uh, concept of frame narrative to in the flood. Um, there is a frame story, an outer story that is Shannon's story and there is an inner story or the embedded story of the dog. The outer story gives life to the inner story and the inner story changes how we are going to approach the outer story in terms of its theme and in terms of its larger significance um, and, and so on. The other narrative pattern that I would like us to keep in mind is the parallel narratives. Uh, so, in parallel uh, narrative structure, there are two distinct but closely related storylines that occur simultaneously. So, think of um, the rail tracks, there are two rails there that run concurrently simultaneously and in the flood can be seen as an example of a parallel narrative structure too. So, we have Chenin's narrative that is uh, kind of stopped at the point uh, when he leaves his flooded home and leaves the dog behind and that does not mean uh, Chenin's uh, narrative uh, completely comes to a stop. His narrative continues at some other point and, and some other place say for example, in Amberpura, but the narrator does not go there. So, we have two parallel narratives in the story um, and the narrator pays attention to Chenin's storyline until he kind of brings that to a halt and Chenin returns to the narrative. So, we have a sort of a parallel structure going on there too and we might want to think about the thematic um, or conceptual significance of having two storylines that kind of um, has um, significance for one another. Now, I would like to look at the beginning of the story uh, in the flood and see the thematic significance of uh, certain parallel structures there. If we read the first line uh, which says, the temple stood on a rise the highest ground for miles around. Despite this, its deity was submerged in water up to its neck. There was water everywhere you looked. 
So, it is a very interesting picture there and a very startling picture right at the beginning of the story. The temple is on high ground, he says, the Narada says, it is the highest ground for miles around and despite this, um, the God, uh, the, the figure of the God is submerged in water up to its neck. And this image is very interesting because soon after we have um, the image of uh, Chenin standing in flood waters. So, one can say that the deity's situation and Chenin's situation resemble one another, they mirror one another thematically, both of them are in waters, the highest in the hierarchy and the lowest in the hierarchy are both in flood waters. So, how are we to interpret this situation? We can say that the flood, a natural calamity, equally affects both the deity and the pariah, and that the ravages of nature are an equalizer. No matter where you live, you could live in a mansion, you could live in a temple, you could live in a hut, everyone is affected equally by um, the flood waters in the case of our story. Now, let us look at other thematic par, uh, patterns that are brought out by this uh, narrative structure. Now, we had the deity and the pariah mirror each other in one uh, case and we can have another uh, and we can ha we have another situation where Chenin's situation and his dog situation mirror one another. Chenin's master if you remember leaves, um, uh, leaves with uh, on his boat leaving behind Chenin and his family. Similarly, we have Chenin leaving behind um, his own dog in the flooded hut. So, again Chenin's uh, situation uh, seems to parallel his master's situation in the fact that both of them leave somebody behind. Now, I would like to take a minute to look at this very interesting uh, narrative uh, uh, technique called personification. Now, what exactly is personification? Personification is the attribution or the giving of a personal nature or human characteristics to something non human. So, you give a kind of a personality to something that is non human. For example, we can say that the sea is angry especially when there is rain and storm on the seas, we can say the sea is uh, being angry. Anger is something that is a very human characteristic, but we kind of transpose the human characteristic onto a non-human uh, thing in nature. And we can also say that personification can be a representation of an abstract quality in human form. For example, a villain can personify evil, evil is an abstract quality and somebody can embody that, um, that is also uh, called personification. I would also like to look at anthropomorphism today. And what exactly is anthropomorphism? The definition, the dictionary definition is the interpretation of non-human things or events in terms of human characteristics. Um, for example, we can say the wind is um, talking, especially a particular kind of wind can be um, interpreted as um, kind of communicating to the human beings, the wind having a certain sort of message. And we also talk about computers being evil as, as if computers are malicious in some, or some ways. So, in other words, the attribution of human characteristics or behavior to a god, animal or object can be defined as anthropomorphism. That is it for today, I um, will see you in the next session. Thank you.